as I mentioned right at the start, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy and Titus are controversial in the sense because I think of Paul's desire to get Timothy to confront issues in his own culture that are contrary to the Christian gospel. So there's always going to be tension in the Christian life because of what Paul says in chapter 1, verse 3. Now, we don't use this word this way, I think, anymore. In fact, I suspect a lot of non-Christians would use this word against Christianity. But Paul, in all examples, there's five examples in the New Testament of the use of the word myth, it always is used in the negative. He basically is trying to say that society and culture are a myth. Now, for you, you hear that and go, that doesn't make sense because myth in my context means something that's false, something that doesn't exist. And that is true in the ancient world as well. So for Paul, if he saw somebody worshipping Zeus, he would say, that's a myth. In other words, that is just palpably nonsense. There's no such dude who's called Zeus. And in Ephesus, very important, because all of their trade, or a vast majority of their trade, was through the fertility god Diana, or Artemis, known as back then. And Paul got himself into a bit of biffo, almost killed, because he said that you guys are worshipping something that is not real. It's a myth. But that's not the only way the New Testament uses the word myth. They use it in a way that is very similar to verse 3 with false teaching or false doctrine. A simple analogy that some of us may be au fait with or know about would be how we think about astrology. Astrology, according to Paul, would be a myth. But stars are real, aren't they? Zeus ain't real. And so if you set your life by the teachings of so-called Zeus and the Greek gods, you're living a life of a fraud. Because not only is Zeus never real, but anything that Zeus said, by definition, has to be false. That's a myth. But also, Paul would say something like astrology is a myth. In other words, the stars are real, but your interpretation of stars is a myth. And this is how Paul is using it in 1 Timothy quite a lot. And that's why he will want us to get grasp the key thing of this entire series will be Society, in the end, culture is always a myth, which means culture is always an interpretation of what I think are the two critical things in all of life. What does it mean to be human? What does it look like to be a humane society? So for the first century world there in Ephesus, to be human was to worship the Greek goddess Artemis, fertility gods. Now, fertility gods weren't just about prostitution and sex, they were mainly about how does our economy, how does our society survive? No water, no crops, you die. You can't go to Woolies in the first century world. You need to go to the market, buy your food that day. So fertility was increasingly linked not to sexuality, although it was, but to yields and crops. And so you had a God who you thought blessed your crops. And you had to pray to that God, you had to give obeisance you had to give goods to this god you created temples for this god and paul is saying both the god and your interpretation of what it means to be human are not real they're a myth but you see that is no different to us because what we face each and every day in your own heart right now tomorrow morning when you get up and go to school go to work see people at your retirement village no matter where you are you'll be faced with people who have a different world view of what it means to be human. And it will come into conflict with your own. And what Paul's going to say is, verse 5, what do you do with that? Do you wrestle with that, with the idea of that your view is this, the world's view is this, and as they come into conflict, there's only two things that can happen. Verse 5 or verse 6 and 7. You will either give up because it's just too hard to be Christian, you'll depart from these things, and you'll go on to meaningless talk. He doesn't mean you talk stupidity. He means that your interpretation of things is just not true. It's false. And so whatever teaching you do in response to that is false. Now, this will be in two areas, which we'll just touch on briefly over the next 
couple of minutes because each and every week Paul will have some context that is one of these two areas. The first area is stuff in church, verse 3. I urge you, he says, that when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus. If you don't know that, in the modern world, that's between Turkey and Greece. So he says, Ephesus is in Turkey, right on the coast. Paul and a group of people have had to flee Ephesus because they were stoned to death and bashed within an inch of their lives, a lot of them. They've gone into Macedonia, sort of northern Greece back then, and he's left our brother Timothy in Ephesus because the church has been doing the wrong things and he didn't want to leave them by himself. You can see, stay there in Ephesus. Here's the purpose of why I want you to stay there, so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer. So the first myth that Paul wants to focus on is when people in churches just say stupid stuff or more importantly, when people in churches teach the wrong things. Why? Because it cannot promote the end of verse 4, which is advancing God's work. To know the wrong stuff will not achieve faith. It won't achieve the opposite, maybe. It won't make you a non-believer, but it just won't help your faith grow. You'll always be unhappy, living at the tension of believing, sadly, the wrong things and how they come into conflict. Heaps of examples, but we'll focus on them in weeks to come. But a few might be that if some churches or people in church were to stand up and say that Jesus is not God, we couldn't allow that, could we? If there's a whole stream of Christianity which are called Unitarians, even in Anglicanism, who don't believe in the divinity of Jesus, our J-Dub friends up the road, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus, they don't believe in the divinity of the Holy Spirit. They're Unitarians. They believe that this one God is all those other two beings. He is both Jesus and the force of God, as in Star Wars. May the fourth be with you, brothers and sisters, from last week. That's their sort of belief. Now, if that sort of materialistic view of the world occurred in our churches, it will not do verse 4. It won't advance God's work. So we can't let bygones be bygones and we all have different beliefs, just get along. That's not what Paul says. Because false teaching, false views about Jesus don't achieve God's work. When Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. That's either true or it's not. It can't be half true. So is Jesus the way to the Father or is he not? Did his death on the cross pay the penalty for my rejection of God or not? This is what Paul is saying. There are some things which you just have to refute. You can't allow ministers of the gospel, and hopefully you've done this over many years, you go around and have nominations for different ministers to come here before me as well, and if a minister had have told you that they do not believe that Jesus is the only way to the Saviour, you hopefully stand up, turn around, walk out, ring the bishop up and say, mate, we've got problems. Or if I stand up here and start talking what you think and know to be wrong, you must come and speak to me. It's too important to let false things stay. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. He believes in so many good things. Just this one thing he's got wrong. He thinks that Jesus is both saviour and there are other ways to God as well. But at least he believes in Jesus. He just believes also in other gods. Not, not on, Paul says. Does not advance the gospel. The second one, I think, is the hardest one. This is the idea of the myths and endless genealogies promoting controversies, speculations that verse 3 and 4 go on to talk about. Because what Paul will talk about, I think, is the far harder one. Each and every one of you have a desire which is not Christian. If it were not so, you'd be Jesus. Which means we're always going to be in conflict with our sense of self and our Christian identity. There's always going to be tension and conflict. That's what it means to be human, unless you're already Jesus and I don't know it. In other words, there is problems that God wants to work through you to help you become more and more like him, which means I need to change. Now, as these conflicts arise, they'll generally be about what the world thinks is good versus what God thinks is good. And the, co and the reason for that is that I have drunk the Kool-Aid of the cultural myth. Now, on the screen, just very quickly... I'll be surprised if 
all of us don't have some of these ideas going through our head. If you were raised in the 50s and 60s, you already know that this is how people started to think. Life was about keeping up with the Joneses, getting ahead in life. Education is the key to prosperity. None of that is Christian. None of it. None of it. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just not Christian. Not Christian. But this is the way many people grew to think, that I need to get ahead, my aim in life leads to what when you do those three things? A materialistic view of the world. My aim in life is to have a second house. My aim in life is to have my kids go to university. My aim in life is to see them be a doctor or a lawyer, or maybe not a lawyer. Actually, my brother's a lawyer. I shouldn't say that too loud. My mother will be watching this about three o'clock. My aim in life is then to be highly educated and successful people. And you say, well, that's not Christian. And someone will say, well, the opposite's not the truth. My aim of life is not to have them poor, destitute, criminals. Again, you ask the wrong questions, you always get the wrong answer. That's the wrong question. The right question is, how the world thinks, how does that come into tension with what God thinks? Now, we've moved, haven't we, through the 60s and 70s to a different mindset, I think, which can be popularised with the old Bobby McFerrin song from the 1990s, for those of you who remember it. Don't worry, be happy. Most people's aim in life is to be happy. So it may not be materialism that is king, but guess what we've replaced stuff with as king? You're looking at him. I am king of my own life. I am boss. I am God. My aim in life is to be happy. And how dare you say things to me that make me feel less happy? Because the aim in life is pleasure. I don't mean pleasure in sort of doing the wrong things. To be inwardly pleasurable about yourself, your own identity, how you feel about yourself is king. And anybody who says something that makes me feel worse about myself automatically is somebody that should be shunned. That's not Christian. Let's go back to that last slide for us. Thanks, Liam. Popularised by those two Beatles songs. Well, John Lennon really for the last one. Love is all you need. It is true. Love is all you need. But they're really talking about love from another, which I think has been moved from 67 to today. It's love of self, isn't it? You've got to love yourself. Imagine there's no heaven. Remember the next line? It's easy if you try. You see, 1 Timothy, that's a myth. That's a cultural myth. Just because you believe it, don't make it true. But once you believe it, you start to live your life in consequence of that belief. And Timothy is being told, you can't let people in churches believe that. Why? Because it's not verse 5. It's not loving. Just to be silly for a moment, if you knew a person you loved was heading the wrong direction in life, crossing the road and about to be hit by a truck, you wouldn't say, let us play dice with God and see if the truck misses. You would do everything in your power, if you're a loving person, to stop the error leading them on the wrong path in life. And this is really what he is saying in this passage. Now, I think in the history of the church that I've been in the last sort of uh, 30 years or so, we do, in our Anglican tradition, verses 3 and 4 well. We're very concerned rightly so with verse 3 and 4 I don't want you to know falsehood I don't want you to embrace false doctrine because I don't believe that God's work can be advanced by knowing falsehood but I wonder whether all of us at some point in time struggle with verse 5 now I said this at men's group during the week Paul must have said verse 5 no doubt on purpose now when I was uh, teaching for my staff I used to say don't make rules you can't enforce. If you've got a rule that says no talking, that's your rule. No talking when I'm talking. And that's your rule in class. And then people start talking and you don't enforce it. Either the rule was stupid or you didn't enforce it. Because what is the aim of all rules? What's the aim of commands? To be obeyed. The aim of commands is to be obeyed. And I think that was the natural consequence in verse 5 that you would have expected. Look at the logic. 
verses 1 through to 4. He basically says, I want you to command certain people not to teach any of that wrong stuff anymore. Don't do it. You've got to stop them doing it. Stop them devoting themselves to myths and endless nonsense because they promote speculations and controversies. And that's not by faith. God's work can't be advanced. The goal of this command is obedience. But it doesn't say that, does it? That's what I would have expected. He's saying to Timothy, be firm, teach it. Stop t- allowing false people to get up there and teach the wrong things. Close those small groups down. But that's, he says the goal of this command is love. Now, why do you think he focuses on love and not obedience? Obviously, obedience is important because a lack of obedience does not promote God's work. Verse 4. But he doesn't reinforce it by saying the goal of this command is obedience. And I think the reason he does that is because he knows the human heart. He knows who you are. And that is, I can be very good at ticker box. That if you give me seven rules to obey, if I've obeyed six of them, I think I'm pretty good. I'm close enough, God. If you've given me all these doctrines, I can agree to them. If everybody who's ever said the creed was a Christian, then the world would be full of Christians. We can say things without believing them, can't we? We can say a prayer without believing that God actually listens. We can say a confession without really feeling that we're confessing. You can talk the talk without actually feeling the walk. And so he wants to reinforce that the goal of life is love. Because Christianity, in one sense, is always like that scales of justice, isn't it? Truth and love. You can know the truth, but if you don't love, 1 Corinthians 13, you've forgotten the truth, really. You can know for certain that Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour, but if you don't love other people, have you really felt the love of the Lord Jesus? And so he, he keeps them in beautiful symmetry. You can love people with your whole heart. You can love people. People love lots of people. But it doesn't mean they're loving them with the truth. So it's family love, it's sentimental love, it's erotic love, it's desire. It's lots of forms of love. But unless it's love informed by truth, it won't advance God's work. So he wants to make sure we keep both in a beautiful harmony and tension with one another so that I don't just focus on what I know. And so this is how it can play out. I've felt this in myself. I'm sure you have as well. When you see somebody doing the wrong thing or believing the wrong thing, the first thing you want to say is, that's wrong, that's not right. Sometimes when the J-dubs knock on my door, I get this macabre joy come in my heart. I'm going to tear these people a new one. (laughs) Oh, oh, here they come. Let me just bring out my Greek New Testament. (laughs) Let's have a look. Oh, you've got John chapter 1 open. Let's open that up. Where's, um, yeah. Who am I impressing here? Now, I was obviously a bit silly, but the whole idea is the less love you have, I think the more likely you are to argue from your own truth rather than from the desire to change the other person. It's about winning the argument, it's about proving I am correct. But by having love as the key emotion, it actually becomes an other person-centred love. Remember, love is defined not by the world's mythical view of love, Be happy, Bobby McFerrin, love yourself. Yeah, love yourself, but only in the way that God's loved you. You are valuable in God's eyes, not because you're lovely, but because you're created to be loved. That's why you are a lovely person. God's created you with the desire to be loved, yes, but he's given you value because you are his. It's not about self-love. It's about receiving God's love and God's understanding of love That counts. Otherwise, we'll end up with our own definition of love. So the key thing you can see, verse 5, is love. But then he gives you three things, as we end, that help shape what this love is. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Let me just back up just a little bit. What's the whole point of what he's trying to do? The whole point is what he's trying to do is that in life, in churches, more so than out in the world, I never knew how hard it was to be a Christian until I was one. 
Before being a Christian, I used to just live my life my own way. You'd stuff up and you'd move on. But when you're a Christian, now you've got God's standard, God's desires, and he would say to you sometimes, Trent, you don't love well enough. You don't love that other person. You might know the truth, but do you love them? And so what happens is you get this conflict now between God and how he wants you to grow as a person and you and what you want to be. And they're in conflict. And this is what verse 5 and is now starting to wrestle with. And he'll provide practical examples over the next couple of months. So sadly, let me prep you right now. Prepare to be in tension over the next couple of months. Each and every week, there'll be something that you just don't like. Praise the Lord. As I said, if you loved everything about Christianity, you'd be Jesus. But there's going to be tension. Accept that there's going to be tension. And the tension is always going to be working through these ideas in verse 5. For example, you need to have a pure heart and a good conscience. Now, in the ancient world, that's a way of describing the two aspects of humanity that everybody, no matter what your culture was, agreed on. A pure heart is your emotional core, your heart. The ancient world believed that the heart was the centre of emotions. And then so he's linking that idea in here. You need to have a pure heart. In other words, your desires will start to wrestle with God. That is a good thing. If God didn't care about you, he'd just let you wander down the wrong path. Oh, there he goes. There's that stupid trend again, looking at porn. But if he speaks to you through his word and says to any sin that you're doing, that's not good, it's not helping you, it won't help you to love your wife, won't help you to love your neighbour, won't help you to love your work colleagues. No matter what the issue is, it'll start to wrestle with you. Now what are you going to do about it? The options are in your text. You could do verse 6. You could just push it aside and start to depart from the faith because it's not good sometimes we think to have this negativity in our own minds about ourselves God's telling me how bad I am or maybe he's telling you how good you could become and the only way of improving your ability to love other people is to deal with the motivations in your heart that are currently stopping you doing that maybe that's what he's saying we focus on the negative. God is stopping me being this person, stopping me think this way. Just maybe he's saying, I've got a better path for you. Imagine if you embraced this way of thinking. Now, that'll be up in the next couple of weeks, about nine weeks of them. A pure heart is a person who sees their own heart is not pure. Remember Psalm 51? Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, and cleanse me. In other words, there's nothing pure about my natural heart. How did your heart become pure? This is the power of the verses that we always skip. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. What does Christ Jesus mean? Paul often flips between Jesus the Christ and Christ Jesus. And when often he puts Christ in front of Jesus, he's trying to say to you, he's your king, he's your boss. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. He's boss of your life. So when Jesus says, doctrine, I'm the way, the truth and the life, is that true or not true? Okay, so if I think that's not true, that if I would like to believe that you can get to heaven by other means, then two things need to happen. I need to listen to Jesus and change my opinion. Because he's the Christ, not me. Has he spoken the truth? If he has, then I need to change my falsehood. The second is, by the command of God, our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. God and his Son are the Saviour of humanity, which means you needed to have a view of humanity about yourself that says, I needed saving. There is something about me that means that I'm not naturally saved by God. I need saving. Why do I need saving? Because I don't have a pure heart. Why? Because I think different thoughts to God. I've rejected him. I've accepted my own ways of living for myself. And God says, I love you. Therefore, I'm going to demonstrate my love to you so that you can change your life to be more like the life that I've created you to live, the better life. Or as you know from John 10, the abundant life is a life God has for us. If you don't, you will become verse 6, 
a person who departs from the faith. That as we wrestle with these concepts that we don't like about ourselves or about this world, if we accept the world's view rather than God's view, we're taking steps to depart from the faith. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It just means you're not living the life that God would have you live, which means you're not going to advance the gospel in your own life nor in the lives of others. Now, some of us will then focus on the end of verse 7 and go, this does not seem very loving. If you're not sure about that, how about at the door on the way out, I say this to you. You do not know what you are talking about. In fact, you may say that to me on the way out of the door. You may say, touche, Trent, touche. You do not know what you are talking about or what you so confidently affirm. That's why I can't be Trent says versus you says. Or Zeus says. It must be about what God says that counts. So if I say stuff that can't be proven either through its accuracy to the word of God or as an application of God's word, you should come up to me and say, Trent, I think you've misunderstood the passage. That would be the loving thing to do, wouldn't it? For fear that I may then go and speak to some other person and try and convince them of something that you think is wrong. But let's end with the middle part there of verse 5. So I've said that the critical thing would be that as we come into tension, our heart's desires will be at conflict with God at some point. And our heart will need to change. The next thing he says is, your mind starts to work. You have a good conscience in Christ. And so God has given you the help, the help that you need, the work of the Spirit in your life, so that you can think clearly that murdering your neighbour is probably not the right thing that God would have me do. We all agree with that. I see my neighbour's car open, the keys in the ignition. Gee, I'm tempted to start driving it away. None of you are having those thoughts. But what about things that are more likely to just be on the edge of faith things that will come up over the next few weeks? The number one sin mentioned in the Bible is, well, after idolatry, is greed. 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 And it's mentioned quite a bit in 1 Timothy. We're going to focus potentially in your mindset on some of the more spurious or singular ones. Women and men in 1 Timothy 2. And we'll get to that. But remember the critical thing is, what's my relationship to greed? Because greed, for example, dictates how I think about other people. How I think about myself and how I use my resources. How I love you with my resources. And so that's critical what Paul thinks. So when you come to verses like 5, the goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience, because also greed in the Bible is linked to faith. How much do I trust God? That if I love you with things that God has given me, will I get more of those things? It's linked to trust. If I give money to World Vision or the poor or to church or to whatever, is that a, I've worked hard for that. Is that a good use of my money? Well, God would say, I didn't realise it was your money, Trent. I thought I gave you those resources to help you love people, care for one another, beginning with your family and other people. That was the purpose. And then someone will say to you, are you saying I can't have a second house? Well, you ask the wrong question, you get the wrong answer. What God is saying is, use your mind, use your emotions to see whether what you is doing leads to Sincere faith, the end of verse 5. That's what it is, sincere faith. So it's not about the what, it's about the how and the why. Some things are about the what. Don't murder your neighbour, the what is bad. But there are many things in life that aren't about the what, what you do, but about how and why you do it. And Paul's going to speak a lot about those things going forward. And so that's going to be the tension. How do I live my life as a Christian dealing with some of these emotions that I know are not good but other people never see it they don't see my heart but God does and so that's the wrestle verse 5 if over the next couple of months you're struggling with what on earth we're talking about come back to verse 5 come back to verse 5 what is the goal of the Christian life this is already presupposing you're a Christian if you're not a Christian here this morning the goal of life is back in verse 1 you need to see that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour 
But if you're a Christian, the goal of your life is to live out the love of God in your life and to wrestle with your emotions, that pure heart, with your mind, thinking through, so that you may arrive at a sincere faith, well thought out, well articulated in your mind and heart, so that you do the very things that your faith has enabled you to do. That's the Christian life. Why? So that when the world tells you to act differently, you know that it's false. You know that it's a myth, that its interpretation of what it means for you to be a man or a woman or a human being in this world is flawed. And you can say no with a pure heart and a good conscience. Why? Because your faith is more sincere today than it was last week. How did that happen? Because you've wrestled with God's word. You've fought the fight of your desires and your mind not being in concert with God. You've wrestled with that. If godliness was easy, we'd all be capital S saints. Another erroneous truth. What is life? Life is grounded in a firm knowledge of who God is, a firm knowledge of what he's done for you, and now how he wants to live your life. So over the next few weeks, keep coming back to verse 5 and of chapter 1. I'm going to end in prayer. I'm going to pray out verse 5. Heavenly Father, remind us that the goal of your command is love. Heavenly Father, help us deal with times that our heart is not pure. And help us rejoice that when we see your truth and we agree with it, when we see people and we love them. Heavenly Father, we give you great thanks for the pure heart that you've created in each of us. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for those of us who are believers here that our conscience is clear. It has been cleansed. And now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, we ask you that when we read your word, you may shape our desires, you may shape our minds that things that are not of Christ are jettisoned and things that are of Christ are held on to. For this, Lord, is the definition of a sincere faith. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.